<clears throat> okay, so we're looking for question 17, which starts on line 395. And the 17th question asks, how does Yaga manage to use these lines <clears throat> to provoke sexual anxiety whilst claiming to do the reverse? <clears throat> so Othello asks, would, nay, and I will, and he's responding to Yago's question about, would you, you would be satisfied. Remember, in that previous passage, satisfied obviously carries this sexual connotation. Um, but in these lines, Othello's directly talking about finding out about what has happened between Desdemona and Cassio. <clears throat> so Iago says, and may, but how? How satisfied, my lord? Would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on, behold her topped? So he asks all these questions and <clears throat> provides sexual images here of, of Othello being like a voyeur, like a supervisor, grossly gaping, staring intently whilst his wife sleeps with another man, beholding her topped, beholding her being atopped by a man. So this image is the, the same one that he uses in Act 1, Scene 2. There's an old black ram tupping your white you. Here, crops up again in his lines where he is claiming that he is sort of thinking through the plan for Othello, but actually what he's doing indirectly is providing him with images of himself as a voyeur and his wife cheating on him to provoke his anxiety, to provoke his paranoia. Othello responds, death and damnation, oh, and he's full of rage at this point in time. Iago goes further with this. It were a tedious difficulty, I think. You know, he desperately doesn't, Othello doesn't want to hear more of this, but Iago then starts to think through all the steps of how to make that a possibility. And every time he mentions it, it makes Othello more uncomfortable. It were a tedious difficulty, I think, to bring them to that prospect. It would be so difficult to get you in a situation where you could look at your wife engaged in sexual activities with another man. Damn them, then. If ever mortal eyes do see them bolster more than their own. And so here, he's talking about mortal eyes are the eyes of human beings. If any other people see them, bolster more than their own means to sort of pillow more than their own. It means basically to function as the pillow for someone else, as if you're underneath them. So the image is again of Desdemona underneath a man. And he invokes here, if only mortal eyes do see them but do this. It's not, I hope they don't do it. It's just, I hope no one actually catches them. So again, giving Othello that sense of anxiety about the, the fact this is going on. What then? How then, he says? What shall I say? Where's satisfaction? So he asks all these questions whilst putting these images into Othello's mind to keep provoking and stimulating his further curiosity for finding out about this n you know, non-existent fact. It is impossible you should see this. Were they as prime as goats, as hot as monkeys, as salt as wolves in pride? And all of these images, these animalistic images, are of traditionally kind of lascivious, horny animals. Hot as monkeys, prime as goats, wolves in pride. In pride here means like in season, as if they're like ready to mate. And fools as gross as ignorance made drunk, as if they were so desperate to sleep with each other and such stupid idiots, like drunkards, sleeping with each other. Even then, it would be difficult for you to do this. So he, again, creates this image of animalistic passion that is provided further basis for Othello's anxiety. But yet, I say... If imputation and strong circumstances, and he means here, if assumptions and likely evidence, which lead directly to the door of truth will give you satisfaction, you might have it. So if assumptions and likely evidence take you close to the truth, they're never going to give you the evidence itself, that might give you satisfaction. But this metaphor of being pressed against the door of the truth, as if there is something going on behind that door that you can't see, is designed to provoke his paranoia and frame Othello as this sad kind of sexual voyeur overlooking his wife having sex with another man. And Othello then says, giving me a living reason she's disloyal. And then Iago claims the opposite. I do not like the office. I don't really want this job. 
but since I am entered in this course so far, pricked to it by foolish honesty and love, I will go on. So he claims here in this in these lines as he's making up this plan on the spot that the reason he knows about this is because Cassio has called out about Desdemona in his sleep as he's been sleeping in the military camp with him. So he goes and tells this lie, and I think he knows as he's telling this lie it's quite a weak lie. It's pretty thin evidence to use to base suspicion about someone being unfaithful to you on someone saying something in their sleep. And he knows it. But he knows that he can build up a stronger case by provoking further paranoia. So the 18th question is then, <clears throat> one of the, actually before we move on, one of the reasons that you have to think in the 17th passage here, why this is so provocative to Othello, is because he, you know, what this seems to be suggesting to us is that there. It's putting the image in, in Othello's mind of Desdemona having this kind of wild, passionate, physical exchange with another man. And it's precisely the thing that Othello believes he's unable to provide. He can't provide that sort of wild animal passion, the sort of physical um, sexuality that Iago has led him to believe that Desdemona cares about. You know, all the way through, Iago, Othello has valued the virtuous, chaste, abstract embodiment of womanhood that he sees in Desdemona, rather than, you know, physical beauty. So he says, but this is what Iago has managed to provoke him into, is paranoia about this animalistic passion. So when he finishes telling Othello the lie about having overheard Cassio talking about Desdemona in his sleep, Othello says, monstrous, monstrous. And Iago just says, no, this was but his dream. And Othello fully believes this. But this denoted a foregone conclusion, something that has already happened. Tis a shrewd doubt, though it be but a dream. And by shrewd, he means a kind of acute fear, a, a, and actually an accurate fear. Tis a shrewd doubt, though it be but a dream, even though it's a dream. And Iago here starts to build up his case like a lawyer. This may help to thicken the other proofs. So it, this may make the other evidence more substantial. It may make it seem stronger. That, to dem that do demonstrate thinly on their own. They're not very powerful on their own, but several of these thin proofs together seem to become stronger evidence. And Othello is losing his temper here. I'll tear her all to pieces. And this is exactly what Iago is trying to create. Diabolical manipulation has created this state of rage where Othello is pledging to violently tear his own wife to pieces before her unfaithfulness and is fulfilling the racial stereotype that Venice has towards Othello at this moment in the early 17th century of this erring barbarian, calling him this kind of wild, impulsive, violent black man. And so Iago has created the stereotype here. It's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so Iago now starts to claim that he needs to calm down. No, yet be wise, yet we see nothing done. She may be honest yet. Tell me but this. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? He knows that he has this handkerchief and he knows that he's already given it to Cassia. And so this is again, the way that he's shaping the way Othello sees. He's already t giving him a pre-formulated way of interpreting this handkerchief when he later sees it in his hand as Casio speaks to Desdemona. This handkerchief also functions as a really powerful symbol in this play of the, the chastity sheets themselves, you know, the white sheet stained with the virginal blood of the woman. And so the, 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 the handkerchief itself embodies everything that Othello is paranoid about, that, he, that his wife isn't a virgin, has slept with someone else, and has corrupted the ideal image that he has of him. So the symbol embodies the different ways that people interpret reality. And that's what this play, and when the, the critics have called this play a tragedy of vision, Iago is the one that is shaping how Othello sees the reality. He's changing how he interprets everything. 
so that when he does see this, it becomes further evidence that thickens all of the other thin bits of evidence that he's created so far. And it's, Othello says, I gave her such a one, it was my first gift. I know not that, but such a handkerchief, I'm sure it was your wife's, did I today see Cassio wipe his beard with? So he's now saying, well, I don't know what it is, but I did see Cassio using it. Othello says, if it be that, and he stops, and Iago interrupts him, if it be that or any, it was hers. It speaks against her with the other proofs. So he personifies the handkerchief here as if it's talking and confessing to her guilt personifies it here and also this is a much stronger claim than he begins with he says in the opening um, this may help to thicken other proofs that do demonstrate thinly he knows that the evidence he's shown him so far is not particularly strong but here this one that he knows that he's got control of he makes a very strong categorical claim about it it speaks against her with the other proofs he's much more confident in the evidence so he seems here to be functioning almost like a lawyer building a case in the courtroom and trying to uh, manipulate the, the, the vision of the other characters, particularly Othello. And it works. Othello says, oh, that the slave had 40 lives. One is too poor, too weak for my revenge. Now I do see it is true. Look here, Iago, all my fond love, thus I do I blow to heaven. He wants the slave to have 40 lives so that he has 40 chances to kill her over and over again. His rage is exploding out of him here. And then in this final passage of religious language, we see him basically kind of kissing goodbye to his Christian identity, that tenuous link that he has to Western society that is precious to him because it allows him to be integrated into 17th century Venice. He kisses goodbye to it. He says, arise black vengeance, which again associates his race and his skin color with evil. From the hollow hell, yield up, O oh love, thy crown and hearted throne to tyrannous hate. He's giving up the crown and his, his identity, his soul, his being. Love itself no longer will sit on that crown, but tyrannical hate, violence, swell bosom with thy throat, for tis of aspics tongues. It's a snake venom, his um, chest is full of snake venom. So we see in this line here, Othello articulating that transformation from virtue to vice. And this is, this is Iago's triumph. There's something triumphant for Iago about this. It's completely um, victorious because he here has articulated directly that change from that noble, virtuous military commander to sinful, vice-ridden, tyrannical hatred. And that's exactly the goal when he says, you know, he, when he articulates about Desdemona in the end of Act 2, Scene 3, I will turn her virtue into pitch. I'll turn her virtue into black tar and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. Out of her own morality, I'll make the trap that's going to catch everyone like a spider's web from the virtue of her character. He's going to use all of people's good qualities against them. It's exactly what he's done to Othello. This is exactly what Othello finds himself explaining here. Not only carrying it out, but actually articulating it. He explains that that's what's happened to him. He's changed into this kind of evil figure. And now that allows Iago to sort of pretend that he's persuading him otherwise. Othello's just saying, blood, 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 in this kind of simmering rage. And Iago just says, patience, I say, you may change your mind. So he pretends here that he's trying to reason with him, which leads us to that 19th question. How do these lines create a sense of victory or success for Iago? And Othello says, never, Iago, like to the Pontic Sea, compares his rage to the Black Sea up in the, the, the sort of southern point of Russia, whose icy current and compulsive course, so he's comparing his rage to the flowing of an icy water current, never keeps retiring ebb, so it never slows down, but keeps due on, it keeps moving forwards, to the Propontic and the Hell's Pond. Now, these are the points where the Black Sea meets the Mediterranean. So it keeps flowing to its point of destination. Even so, in the same way, my bloody thoughts with violent pace shall never look back. My violent thoughts with, with violent speed 
will never stop or look back or take a pause. Like he's convinced and has full conviction in his desire for vengeance. Never ebb to humble love. He won't, this flow won't give up to humble love. Till that a capable and wide revenge swallow them up. Till I get my revenge and it gobbles up all of these feelings of rage. And he kneels down. And I think this is a sort of, this is meant to sort of ironically represent prayer. The moment where he commits to sin, he ironically adopts a position of what's called genuflection. When you, when you kneel down in front of someone to show your respect, usually. He's adopting this posture, and it's actually the ironic reverse of what he's doing. And he addresses heaven by yond marble heaven. By that marble heaven, he, he freezes it into stone. Which shows us, I think, the way that he's kind of given up worrying about his soul. He doesn't care because he's so angry. In the due reverence of a sacred vow, I here engage my words. So here, I think there's a sort of ironic reversal of the wedding ceremony. He commits in a sacred vow, which is exactly what we do on a wedding ceremony. He engages his words, but they're words in which he pledges the desire to kill his wife rather than marry her. And Iago, being the master deceptive manipulator that he is, keeps him on his knees. He says, do not rise up. Do not rise yet. And this is where Iago is at his most um, dissembling. He's pretending to be one thing whilst being another. He, can, he claims here the virtuous duty to Othello that he's actively involved in undermining by ruining his life. Witness you stars above, you ever-burning lights above, you elements that clip us round about, you um, elements that surround us. Witness that here, and he's making a pledge as well, Iago doth give up the execution of his wit, hands and heart. He gives up all of his intellectual faculties, his emotions, his feeling to wronged Othello's service. He's going to put everything he's got into, into fixing Othello's um, situation and to um, revenge. Let him command and to obey shall be in me remorse. What bloody business ever. So let Othello command the situation and I will obey him. To obey shall be in me, and he means compassion. It's my way of showing compassion to him whatever the bloody business he chooses to do. So it gives Othello this false sense of power, but it also makes Othello seem like he's now in charge of this tragic plot as it moves towards its unbelievably painful climax as he ends up killing his wife. He kills himself. It's, it's a deeply tragic final act. In this moment, it's putting him in control of it. Let him command. He's done all of his manipulation now. And it gives Othello this sense of power which is false but also makes him to blame for what follows and so he's managing here to invoke that duty that honesty that he, he, Othello keeps misunderstanding in Iago he's, he's doing a good act of an honest duteous servant at the moment where he is sealing his destruction and in the last lines of the scene we have this wicked moment of irony he's Damning his wife, Desdemona, damn her, damn her, come with me apart, I will withdraw to furnish me with some swift means of death. I'm trying to work out a quick way of killing uh, for the fair devil, he calls her. And that paradox there captures that instability in his thinking that she's both fair and virtuous and yet sometimes, somehow at the same time a devil. Now art thou my lieutenant. So this, this final question here is about how these final lines are considered as an ironic subversion, a sort of turning upside down of the value of virtue, honor, duty, and all these abstractions that Othello is deeply committed to. Well, because this is the supposed promotion that Iago is angry about not receiving. But at the moment of his biggest betrayal of Othello, Othello makes him the lieutenant. So what that reveals to us is that his behavior, which is the complete opposite of virtuous and honorable and dutiful, is what has secured that promotion. And so we, that moment of power, this whole scene is one extended 
piece of dramatic irony where we can see that Othello is being manipulated, but he has no idea, is warning us about the dangers of seeing the goodness in people at, with no suspicion of their, of their limitations as human beings. It's quite a cynical vision of human behavior that if you commit to seeing other people through a sort of filter of idealized abstractions like virtue and honor and nobility, you're going to misinterpret things. You're going to miss the reality, which is somewhat darker. And that's a Iago's great strength as a character is that he understands the dark components of the human psyche. He understands exactly what makes people motivated. And then he ends that scene with this grim pledge to Othello. I am your own forever. I am deeply committed to you forever. And this is almost like a kind of grim marriage that takes place instead of the sexual consummation with his actual wife. So there's a substitution going on there. But we look at what has happened in this scene, and Othello begins this scene having faith in Desdemona. And in the space of this one scene, Iago has managed to completely destroy that faith and completely transform Othello's sense of um, the entirety of his identity from a noble um, servant of the Venetian state into this wildly angry, chaotic, um, vengeful man who is plotting the murder, the violent murder of his own wife.